right, here we go. <laughs> uh, my name is Dakota Wagner. I am on the executive board with uh, Forest Hill, North Carolina, and I'm going to be the moderator today. So I uh, just wanted to welcome everybody, and we're going to get started here. Um, going to go over a couple logistical things, go over the agenda, pass it over to Bob to go over um, some housekeeping, and then we'll get it kicked off. Uh, Bob, do you want to go ahead and talk about housekeeping? Uh, just real quick, folks, if you'll keep your mics muted, unless you're called upon to um, ask a question or something like that. As you do get questions, though, through the presentation today, if you'll type those into the chat, we will track those to make sure that they get asked by the presenters. I do know there'll be time at the end of today's webinar for further questions and discussion. Um, if you're having uh, troubles with Zoom or something, feel free to put that in chat also, and I will do my best to try to uh, chat with you to resolve any of those issues that you might be having. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Bob. All righty. So we've got a great lineup today. Um, the topic of today's workshop is taking action, where to start. And um, we're going to start off by doing a quick review. From our last workshop, we had a goal sharing activity, and then we have um, a couple of presentations and a couple of interactive uh, opportunities for everybody. The first presentation will be setting conservation goals for your land with John Eisenhower from North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And then our next presentation will be steps to managing your land for conservation uh, with Dakota Paris, North Carolina Forest Service. And I will say this is the first time I've ever been in the same room, quote unquote, with another Dakota. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting for me. Um, and then we'll have another activity and a brief wrap up and a couple announcements, and then we'll have time for discussion. And so with that, um, I'll go just jump right on into it. So during our last virtual workshop, uh, we ended with the question, share a management goal for your land. And we had a lot of different great answers and I wanted to share some of them today to get us started thinking about um, the first presentation. So the first presentation is gonna be talking about how to set an attainable management goal and what that looks like. And so some of the previous responses um, that we had heard were remove invasive plants, plant natives, keep my woodlands healthy, improve wildlife habitat, increase understory habitat, increase biodiversity, create pollinator habitat, Increase bob white, turkey, whippoorwill, giant swallowtail, butterfly populations, and decrease deer and rodent populations. And I think that might have Can been. You hear this? Yeah, that was it. Oh, and then just as a reminder, folks, to please keep your microphones muted. We are in meeting format today, and so while our presenters are presenting and telling their great information, just to give them the full floor so everybody can um, hear everything they have to say. So yeah, these are the goals that some folks talked about during our last workshop, and they're all they're all good goals, but some of them could be um, improved or written in a way that are more attainable and um, can be achieved. And and um, I can't think of the word, but make you less sad if you don't achieve them. <laughs> so um, that that's what I have to share right now, and I'll pass it on to our first presenter of today. So John, if you wanna, I can stop my screen share and floor is yours. That looks great, John. All right, not sure what's going on on my end, but we'll see if we can make this thing work. So I'm John Eisenhower. I'm the um, Wildlife Habitat Coordinator in the Wildlife Management Division with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. I've worked with private landowners about 18 years, helping them manage their property and have seen a lot of um, different aspects and, and interest in 
land management and, and different goals and that kind of thing. And really today just wanted to, to kind of give an overview and, and help flesh out some of those goals that, that you might have provided during the previous session a um, couple, couple weeks ago and figure out how to, how to set your conservation goals for your property so you don't get led astray by, by whatever comes along kind of spur of the moment. And you're going to get to see this flow chart a couple more times through the through the day today, but for the most part, I'm going to kind of work through section two, defining your goals. And you know, goals are are very important. They're the you know they set your destination. They define what you really want to accomplish on your property. And um, certainly, the more you know about your land, um, the better and more specific goals you can define. And it is kind of an ongoing process. As you learn more about your land, your goals might refine and change. So it is an ongoing process. And uh, some of the things that we'll talk about today might be a little more in depth, a little more specific than some of you might be ready to commit to. But at the same time, um, it is a good process to be thinking about as you set where you want your property management to, uh, to shape your property. So, mm -hmm. You know, if we're, we're looking at why goals are important, um, you know, there's several reasons. Number one, it conveys your wishes. And, and that's always important that your family, uh, neighbors, professionals, folks that you uh, are interested in sharing information about your property, they need to know what you're wanting to do with your property. Also helps you identify which professionals you're gonna get guidance from. Uh, it provides some sideboards, so it, it helps to make sure your management doesn't get too far out of line of where you want it to go on the property. You can evaluate guidance based on your goals. So you can look at the information you get in a management plan and evaluate whether it's helping you get to where you want to be with, with your property. Measure results. That's something that a lot of times we don't think about. We think about where we're going but how are we gonna know when we get there? So you can measure results based on your goals. And it really helps you be more satisfied with the land ownership experience and how you manage your property. And you know, one other big thing that, that's important and I've seen it in my family as well as multiple other uh, family units that I've worked with is that oftentimes if you have good, well-defined goals for your property, it, it really stops some of that family feuding that can happen. Um, as you know, one person tries to influence, whether it be a, a, a sibling, uh, a child that, that wants to have a little more influence on property, especially during land transfer, that can be a, a big thing where having goals can help to make that process go a little bit smoother. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about today can be found in the Woodland Landowner Notes, Management by Objectives, this is an old PDF version. It's uh, been updated and online. If we take a look at the fine print, if you will, you can see that goals are a statement of desires for the outcome of future conditions or what do you want to happen on your property. Look a little more, it says goals are typically broad and open-ended and, and they need to be the true reflection of what you want out of your property. And I think what I'm gonna talk about today is probably gonna be a little more specific and get to a little more specific goals than this publication talks about. But there again, knowing that it's just a defining your objectives for the property, what you wanna do, what you wanna see uh, on your property, how you want it to be shaped by management. So if we start talking about setting destination or setting the goals as a destination, you know, your goal should reflect your true desire for the property. It should be achievable based on, uh, you know, real world situations, your abilities, limitations, and resources. It should be specific enough to be evaluated. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about that after a while. Void phrases that are open for interpretation. The more specific you can be, the better. And it's okay to have multiple goals for the, the same piece of property. And goals could actually be stand specific. So 
the bottomland hardwoods on your property might have a different goal than the upland pine forest, and that's all right. So as you're defining and developing your goal, you should consider your interest, especially financial needs. You know, a lot of times we work with landowners and, uh, you know, we're not working in a uh, financial vacuum. You have to really take the real world cost of land ownership and land management and land investment into uh, consideration. Family situations, oftentimes family dynamics can really um, impact land management goals. Proximity to the land. Is it somewhere that you visit on a weekly basis, a daily basis? Maybe you don't visit your property, but a time or two a year, if that much. And that's gonna certainly come into effect and, and come into impact your goals for the property. Your abilities, available resources that you have, whether that be equipment, whether that be uh, financial resources you're willing to invest in the property. And then other features that are unique to you. Uh, we all have different conservation and land ethics. And uh, a lot of times we have unique feelings about land management that we need to incorporate into our goals. So there again, we should think of it as a destination and you know, with any destination, the more specific you can be, the better. Um, and there again, as a land manager and also as a, a professional helping folks develop management plans and, and implement practices, I want that landowner to be happy at the end of the day, whether that's something that I can help them with or whether another natural resource professional is a better fit. And uh, the more specific the goals, the better you can get the input that you need for your management, as well as uh, the management will be implemented in a way that you prefer it to be. So if we're talking about destinations, you know, if I use the term my hometown, that's vague to just about everybody on this meeting today. Uh, we could get a little more specific and I could give you Richfield. And, you know, that might be a good way to define my hometown until you start thinking about how many Richfields there are across the, the country. And, you know, this is one of the big things that some of the more broad goals that are set and defined, it it's, doesn't always get you where you want to be. And I think assistance from a, a professional that has experience managing land and also you be getting more um, involved with your land management and becoming more familiar with your land can certainly help get a better destination in place for your management. So, you know, we can narrow it down to, uh, to Richfield, North Carolina. That's where I was born and raised. But, you know, the more specific, the better. For instance, if we're looking at this piece of property, we might use a, a local term for this piece that's called Richie's Lake. There again, only a few people are gonna know what that means. So you wanna veer away from words that are open for interpretation, phrases that are open for interpretation. Let's try to get as specific as possible. So, you know, we might actually say this is tax parcel. So we're using the tax parcel number to identify where we wanna go or, or what our goals are. And I think that's, okay, but it's not universally accepted. You know, if you just throw a tax parcel number out at somebody, everybody's not going to understand that like they would an address. So trying to keep your goals specific, clear, understandable for a, a lot of different folks are going to help you better manage your property and better define that goal. So as we start talking about a more specific or a better goal, you, know, you can kind of fill in as much information on this list as possible. You know, what do you want to accomplish on your property? Why do you want this to happen on your property? Where do you want it to happen? Who will implement this? How will the activity, activity be implemented? And, and that somewhat hinges on an objective, but I think it's still important. If you know how the activity will be implemented, certainly include that in your goals. And then how and when will you evaluate the goal or consider it implemented? When are you gonna know that you've reached your goal for the property or for that stand? So developing a goal. As you've already seen, Dakota showed you some of the answers that we had 
during the last session. And certainly a lot of things there that explain what you want on your property. And I think as we work through and make something a little more specific, we'll pick one or two of these. If these are your goals that you put up last session, I apologize. But, um, you know, one was to reduce high deer population. And, you know, that's a pretty easy goal. Boom. You know, done. We've reduced the deer population. Have we done what's needed on that tract of land to meet the landowner's objective? Why do you want the deer herd uh, reduced? What's the impact that you're wanting cor to correct because of high deer populations? So fleshing this goal out a little more would certainly help a professional give you more guidance, would help come up with a better plan to implement and get the results that you want on your property. Another one was to create good areas for feeding wildlife. And, you know, there again, that one's pretty easy. We can set up a feeder, set up a wonderful place to feed our wildlife. So, bam, you know, is that successful though? Is that what's meant whenever you're wanting to create good areas for feeding wildlife? Again, the more specific that you can be, the better we can provide guidance and, and help to, uh, to get you the activities on your property that you you wish and desire <clears throat> so like dakota mentioned there were several things here that that were overlapping and i decided we should pull several of the non-native invasive plant goals out and and maybe work through that and use these that seem to be a, a fairly common theme across the attendee attendees in the last workshop um, to to build a goal off of these more general goals that were presented. So, you know, if we're looking at this list, you know, what do we want to do? We want to control invasive plants. Why? We want to improve na native plant diversity and, and we'll kind of throw in there to also improve wildlife habitat. Where? Well, especially in the riparian areas so that as one of the goals says, so we keep invasives out of water courses. Um, I threw in the along travel ways, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Who's going to do it? You know, we don't know yet. How is it going to be done? We still have some questions about that as well. And when? And for any of y'all who have managed invasives, you know that once you get started, it's almost like a from now to eternity kind of battle over non-native invasive species. But yeah, how are we going to wind up evaluating our invasive management program, invasive plant management program to know if we're being successful or not? <clears throat> so if we start building all those bullet points into something that we could say is our goal for the property, you know, we can come up with, with a sentence, and this might be an extreme run on sentence, but uh, I think this would capture a lot of the thoughts that the folks that that put these goals up last meeting. Um, you know, improve native plant diversity using chemical and mechanical methods to control existing populations and limit the spread of non-native invasive plant species on the property. So, you know, we've kind of gone from reducing invasive plants. You know, we've answered some questions. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Where is it going to take place? We could get a little more specific even if we talk about, you know, we want to prioritize uh, treatments within 100 feet of logging roads, loading decks, and riparian buffers to ensure that non-native coverage is no greater than 5% prior to the next scheduled timber harvest, which is in 2026. And, you know, there again, we fleshed that out a little more. We, we've talked about more specifically where, we've talked about when, we've talked about to what extent we want to control non-native invasive species. And as a, you know, a resource professional coming out to, to assist you on the property and to give you guidance on the property, we could really come up with good, clear recommendations to meet this goal. Uh, knowing what you want to do, where you want to prioritize it, and how we're going to wind up evaluating uh, to make sure we're successful, that we're successful in meeting your goal. So 
you know, it, it, this can be kind of a daunting undertaking. Um, I, recently, my, my mom and, and my aunt wound up taking the uh, ownership of my, my family's home place. And it was really troublesome and, and really bothersome and, and just really weighed on them a lot to, to figure out what the goal was for the property now that it had changed ownerships. But it will wind up really proving beneficial in the long run if you take the time to, to define your goals and objectives and understand what they mean um, on the land and in your management plan and how management practices will impact and benefit your goal. You know, there again, being specific, knowing exactly what you're wanting to do, you can really take your property in the direction that you want and to meet the end destination and, and to make sure your property is managed the way that you would like it to be moving forward. And that's gonna be helpful because you'll wind up uh, running into really unscrupulous uh, wildlife biologists who try to sell you on these wonderful things like, oh, you know, what about the children? We need to manage for wildlife for future generations. And that's all well and good if it matches up with your goals for your property. But if you're really needing and wanting financial return on your property, maybe that's not gonna be the best fit for you. On the other hand, you might wind up with guys like this that knock on your door and, you know, hey, we're logging next door, we can get you a great price for your timber. There again, if it matches up with your goal, that might be all right, very cautiously all right. Certainly would seek some additional uh, professional input if you were gonna have some logging done on your property but it, it would give you the information to say, you know, I'm not interested. This is not what my goal is for the property. Um, you know, I'm not interested in, in y'all accessing the property at this time. So there again, strong goals will certainly help you uh, feel more confident in your land management decisions. Uh, thinking about that, that long-term desire for the property, knowing that you've thought it through and that you're, goal addresses some of the challenges such as what equipment you have, what resources you have. It takes into consideration what abilities you may or may not have. Um, it's going to give you a lot more confidence and a lot more um, understanding of how management is going to help you on your property over time. So to kind of wrap up, this is my contact information. Um, but I think more importantly, you know, it's kind of kind of bad if I talk to you about how to set goals for your property and don't share some of my goals for my property. This is a, a piece of property that uh, my wife and I purchased a couple years ago. And you know, these were the goals that we kind of set as we were looking for property and, and whenever we decided if this was a track that we were interested in. And you know, first and foremost, we want to establish a primary residence that's gonna wind up with peace and solitude. And of course, peace and solitude means a little something different to everybody, but we feel like we've maybe found it there. You know, we're gonna utilize active management techniques, including prescribed burning, herbicide application, mechanical treatments, supplemental plantings with an end, you know, with the end of objective or goal for the property is to enhance wildlife, beneficial insect habitat, uh, increase native plant diversity, and control non-native species. And then, let me see if I can get back here on our other screen. And then, you know, finally, because land management and land ownership does cost, we're seeking cost share funds and enrolling tax deferment programs to help reduce management costs and property tax liability. And with that, Dakota, I think I'm, I'm finished with my portion and uh, look forward to hearing how things work out through the rest of this flow chart. Thank you very much. 
Great, thank you, John. And we did have a question come in through the chat box, and then we have some time to answer a couple of questions right now. Um, this first one is from Amy, who says that they are very new to this first session that they've attended. So welcome, Amy. Um, and they're wondering, is there a minimum property size that these guidelines are applicable for? Well, I, I think, you know, as far as minimum property size, you, you would certainly want to adjust your goals according, but you could really take this and, and use it, whether this be your backyard, um, you know, even a window box, realistically. And what do you want to do on this acreage, whether it be an acre backyard that you want to enhance, um, you know, for native pollinators or songbird habitat. Um, it, I don't think that it, it really has a minimum. You do have to realistically adjust your goals, you know, uh, reestablishing a population of, of quail in a in one acre backyard is not realistic, but certainly you can go through this process uh, for any track that you might have. Great, thanks, John. Uh, are there any other questions out there about setting goals for your land? And I'll wait the, the awkward silence of 10 and 20 seconds, waiting for people to type. And there's a clarification question from Jack asking, um, isn't there a, a minimum acreage to qualify for cost share? For some programs, there are minimum acreage requirements. Um, some of the programs require that you have a forest management plan or, or some kind of management plan developed by a, a resource professional. So it, it really is gonna vary from program to program. I think some of the forest service, um, forest development program uh, does have some acreage requirements and limitations. Some of the uh, USDA farm bill uh, programs do have more of a, a production requirement in that uh, you either need to have a, a forest management plan or have some kind of agricultural production that's uh, going on on the property. So there are limitations to call share. Each one's a little different. Um, you know, I always try to reinforce that good call share contracts usually start with, with a strong uh, management plan that I think um, the code is gonna discuss moving forward here. All right, thanks, John. And if folks have questions that they want to ask later as well, um, we'll be having some additional time for questions and discussion um, after our couple other activities and presentation. Um, I'll give another opportunity for someone to ask a burning question if they have it. And if not, we will move on to our next activity. All right. Um, so we can move on to our next activity. And John, actually, if you wouldn't mind just keeping your uh, screen shared on that slide, that's kind of what we're gonna be doing this next activity. Um, and it's gonna be a quick poll just to see where everybody's at on this flow chart. Um, and I will launch the poll in a moment, um, but just wanted to share again what these steps are. Um, number one is getting to know your land and then defining your goals and then contacting the appropriate conservation professionals and then getting a management plan written and then reviewing your management plan with professionals. And then that one kind of splinters off. And then if you're unclear on how, to, uh, how the plan meets your goals, you kind of go back and review. But then uh, you can move on if you understand it, and then you identify actionable practices. And then the seventh is create a personalized calendar. Number eight is get financial assistance if needed. And number nine, implement practices or hire a contractor if a contractor is needed. And then number 10 is enjoy the fruits of your efforts. And then I will say that it probably we can go back again to uh, get to know your land and define your goals because landscapes and forests are always changing. 
So I will get that poll launched. Okay, great. So you should see a screen that just popped up in front of you. Um, if you're on a desktop or a laptop, it, it should have popped up. If you're on a tablet or a phone, it probably also popped up, but I'm not sure. And if you're having issues, please feel free to message or chat um, Bob. And we'll give a little bit of time for people to answer this. Awesome. Yeah, it's looking great. We're getting a lot of people answering. We have, all right, looks like we've got about 26 people participating in this poll right now. So I'll leave it up for a little bit longer. We'll give it maybe 20 more seconds for you to determine where you're at in this flow chart. And then I'll, I'll share out the results for, with everybody. All right, more people are participating. That's awesome. We're about 67% of people, two thirds of everyone. And I'll just say by looking at it now, um, it's pretty, pretty even across the board where some folks are at, which is exciting to see. And I will share that in just two more seconds. All right, three, two, one. I'm ending the poll and I'm going to share results. So everyone should be able to see that and I'll read them out loud as well. So where are you on the path from getting to know your land to enjoying the fruits of your efforts? We had about 16% of people saying getting to know your land, which is great. That's always a really fun and exciting step. Uh, next, 25% of people said that they are working on defining their goals. It's also a fun step. 9% um, of folks said that they are contacting a conservation professional. That one's fun, but can also be hard and sometimes frustrating if you can't find someone that you're looking for. 6% uh, of people said get they're getting a written management plan. And then another 6% said that you're reviewing your management plan with a professional. 13% said identifying actionable practices. 3% creating a personalized calendar. Um, no one is currently getting financial assistance. And then 22% of folks are implementing the practices, which is really exciting. And I'm curious about what practices people are implementing. So if you actually wanna share a little bit about um, any details in some of those, I, I would love to see it in the chat box if you're willing to share. Um, and then we've got nobody answering yet, enjoying the fruits of your efforts. So hopefully soon people can get out there and enjoy um, some of the goals that you've been working towards. All right, so I will stop sharing those results. And we will move on to the next part in our agenda, which is going to be the presentation uh, from Dakota Paris and steps to managing your land for conservation. So John, I think you can stop sharing your screen now. Thank you so much. And then Dakota Paris can start sharing her screen. Awesome, that was great. You might be muted though, because I'm not hearing any sound. I had to find the buttons again, sorry, they moved. Um, hi everybody, I am Dakota Paris with the North Carolina Forest Service and I'll be talking to you about steps to managing your land for conservation. So I'm happy to be with everybody today. So with everything that you have going on, John showed this, this workflow chart and we've talked through it a little bit already. Um, and we'll go through it today a little bit more with everything. So it's really important to have this process and have an understanding. It helps you keep you on track. It'll reduce a lot of the stressing factors 
and allow more a more timely execution of the practices and decrease the number of revisions that may be needed if you have kind of a process that you can work through so that if you have questions, you can go back to that process and just kind of keep moving forward, chipping away at things until you get to where you're ready to be. Going with step one, how, getting to know your land. Getting to know your land can be a variety of different things, but a lot of it comes down to what is going on with the land itself. How does the land lay? Are there a lot of hills and valleys in your land? History of your land uses, was it agricultural? Was it farmland? Was it previously in industrial use and you're converting it back to a different use? What type of plants and animals might be present in the area? And have you had the opportunity to watch the land as it responds to the seasons? Because in different stages of seasons, the land can have different things that occur on it that will help you understand kind of what's occurring in that one section of your property. And that can help you determine what your planned uses for are for these areas and whether or not these areas are going to be suitable sites for these things. If you've got a low line area that actually does a little bit of flooding during rain, you may not want to put something down there that's not going to be tolerant to flooding. Things like that help you understand your land a little bit better to help you as you're moving forward into your step two, defining those goals. What you desire to occur on your land that John talked a lot about earlier, so I'm not gonna focus on a whole lot about, um, but some of those potential goals as John was speaking of earlier could deal with wildlife habitat, um, the hunting, the fishing, bird watching, recreation, all of these different things, whether you're looking for leaving a legacy on down the road, improving water quality on your property and reducing erosion, or even looking more for an investment in your property to aid you in keeping your property or managing your property in a way that you're looking to utilize down the road through timber production or other uh, practices of farming and things like that. The third step that once you have those goals and things outlined and you have all of that kind of in place and have an understanding of what you want to do, then you can look to contact those appropriate professionals. And that comes down to who do you contact? So with your conservation professionals, you have folks in the state and federal agencies such as the North Carolina Forest Service, the Wildlife Commission, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is NRCS, you will hear me refer to that very often as NRCS, uh, the Farm Servants Agency, and the Division of Soil and Water. Those are your kind of your base uh, state and federal agencies that do a lot in the conservation areas and have a lot of contacts and work that they do in those areas. That's not to say that that's everything that's in that field, but that is the majority of the ones who are actively participating. And then you have the private side of the spectrum with the consulting foresters, the private contractors, and then the conservation groups that also play a big role in how things move forward and getting things going throughout the process. Some of the services that can be provided by these professionals can be plan writing, technical advice, on site, uh, meeting with you and discussing through what you're looking to get out of the property and how you want to move forward. Getting the conservation program guidance for any programs that you might be interested in or wanting to learn more about. Call share program guidance if you are in a situation where you're going to need financial aid in order to move forward with any management techniques and activities. Information and contacts regarding tree planting, herbicide applications, any harvesting if they're necessary or warranted or need to be conducted, um, prescribed burning practices that can help you manage, reduce fuel loading, uh, improve wildlife habitat, and also reduce the risk of wildfires and damage to your property um, from those wildfires. And then water quality monitoring are different things as well, as well as information on improving water quality, reducing erosion, and overall protecting your, your property and your woodlands. 
farmland as well. Sorry, woodland is kind of a poor service. I get stuck there. With the way, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. It's a quote by Walt Disney. And in a lot of cases, we can talk through all of this stuff, but when you actually start doing and beginning this process, it begins to make more sense. It begins to kind of get into the process. And as you get into that process, it makes a whole lot more sense to you as you begin to move forward. And when it doesn't, you're always welcome to ask questions of any professionals or anyone you have access to, to get those answers, to get, to get moving. So getting a written management plan is the next step in that chart of that process to help you know where you go next. So at this point, you've got your idea of your, you've seen your land, you've gone through that process of getting to know your land, developing those goals, and you've contacted some of the professionals. Now you're wanting to know, now what do I do? I've done all this, I've talked to you, spoken to you. Now you look at getting a management plan, something in writing, something for you to go back and refer to. Because when you meet with a professional, I promise the professional is probably going to list off and spout off a ton of information to you. And if you're like me, I will remember some of that long enough to answer a question here or there. And then I will forget about half of what you just told me if I don't write it down or I don't get it in writing. So getting a management plan helps to keep things in track and help you to remind you about some of the things that were discussed and talked about. But with those conservation plans, you've got different parts in the plan. You'll have information on your land and just overviews of the land. And then you'll have kind of a summary of your goals and objectives. And the goals and objectives are a big part, a big component. A plan can be as simple as, it, as you want it to be. The more simple your goals and objectives, the more simple your plan is gonna be. The more detail and the more information that you provide to, your, to the professional that's going to be writing your plan or taking part in giving you these management recommendations, the more information they're going to be able to give you. I always talk to people and ask the question, okay, what do you want out of your property? What is your vision for this land? How do you see it in 20, 30 years? What is your dream that you want to do? And what are the objectives and goals that you want to try to use to get there? And that helps me to understand where they are, what they want to learn about, and kind of be able to kind of steer the plan more to their objectives and their goals in place so that we are hitting all those check boxes and getting all those things out of their land as much as possible that they're interested in doing. You'll have summaries of on-site conditions of what they're seeing when they're out there and then those additional information and recommendations on how to move forward and get there. So all those different plan topics can go in the range from timber uh, production as management for monetary wildlife, soil protection, and biodiversity development, and overall forest health. All of these things tie together. So even if your management objective is only wildlife, well, in wildlife, a lot of times you also benefit the soil and the water and the timber to some degree. And when you're managing for timber, you will still benefit your fish and your wildlife to some degree. But each one of these components and plan topics is going to benefit on how much information you as the landowner are providing to that service professional that they can turn around and give back more specific information. Uh, whether you're looking to use, have more uh, recreation on the property, such as walking trails, bird watching, just general aesthetics of you just like to be able to go out and enjoy the peace and tranquility of your property. If there are any threatened and endangered species on the track that you, even if you know about them, if you don't, and you're interested in learning more about them, that can be something that can also be discussed as well as fire management use and the different benefits and the things that it can be done to work forward with your property. Um, you've also got different historic sites that could be talked about in a plan. 
and then additional things such as the carbon cycle and then estate planning on how to hold on to your property and how to look at passing it along down the line for generations to come. And again, all of this is dependent upon how much information the landowner provides to the professional that is trying to generate and compose and compile this plan. And you'll have uh, different people that you will have different pieces of this plan from. So not, it's not always a one-stop shop. So from my side of the world with the Forest Service, you would get a lot more on the timber side of things. And then if you were to want additional information on wildlife, you would go to someone like Mr. Eisenhower and get in with the Wildlife Commission and get one of their biologists to help you along the way. So there's different professionals that have different niches that will be able to benefit you more along the way as you move forward. But these are just some of the topics that they can cover. Once you receive that plan, it's good to go and make sure that you're looking over the plan and see what does this mean? When you're reviewing with management professionals, what does this mean? This is your time to ask for clarification this is the time when you need to make sure you've read through the plan that has been presented to you and that you've looked at all aspects of what they're trying to see. And then you ask questions. If there's anything you're unsure about, now's the time to ask. You can still ask later too, but at this point when you're in the beginning stages and you just received it, there's time to go through and kind of adjust things. If there's something that doesn't exactly adhere to what you're looking for, or you don't understand how to get to that next part, this is the time to communicate with that professional and go ahead and make those revisions as needed. And remember, this is a living document. Any plan that is generated is going to morph and change over time. You can have goals associated with what you want to do, but the actual management may change over time because your goals may also change or adjust over time as well. So this is something that can be continually updated and worked through. So anytime you get to a point where you're confused, you don't understand something, ask questions. I always tell people there's no such thing as a stupid question. The only one is the one that you never asked because if you don't know, you don't know. You can't know until you actually ask and receive the answer. So it's great to ask questions. Questions are a great thing to have. The next step would be to identify your action items. What can you actually do? So action, actionable things are things that you can physically do. So any herbicide treatments to control any invasive species, that's an actual on the ground item that can be done. Harvesting of timber for whether it's of age, has disease, inf infestation, and needs to be reset in order to revive the stand and the forest ecosystem, that may be something, that's also something that can be done. A burn is something that's an action that can actually be done. Soil stabilization to reduce erosion and to protect the integrity of the water quality of the area is something that you can work on as well as planting trees to restabilize or even planting native grasses and wildflowers and just different things. Any of those things are things that you can physically go out there and get your hands dirty and get done. That's something that you can do. So that is also associated, associated with getting through your maintenance practices. So bush hogging a field or an access. If you've got grasses in an area to stabilize your roadways and you're looking to bush hog those areas and additional meetings with professionals, all of those are things that you can get done and things that you'll be able to do going forward. Once you've figured out and identified all those pieces, you're gonna to look to create that, that management calendar that understanding of when do I get things done? When do I do these things? And a management timeline can be, as a calendar and timeline can be as simple as lining out, okay, in the spring of 2022, I met with the professionals and I got my management plan and I discussed some options. Well, then maybe going on down the line, say in this example, 
uh, for this particular one. In the fall of 22, one of the recommendations was to conduct a herbicide spray. Well, fall would be the time that that would need to be done because it's going to be one of those time periods that you may get uh, some of the best uptake by those certain invasive species. And then going forward on down the line, another action item would be, have been planting an, a field in shortleaf pine and then open fields in native grasses and forbs, getting those things kind of established and trying to get things along the line. Then going down to one of the next actions may, have, may be thinning in 2040, thinning those shortleaf pines and then going through the selective harvest and then finalizing with the updating of your plan in 2050. This is a generic idea, but the basic goal is to get things in order and to figure out when those times need to be occurring so that you can kind of have those reminders throughout the years and the times coming up. So it, when spring rolls around, you have the understanding that now's the time when I'm going to need to be doing this practice, and, or I'm getting ready to have to this summer, There's, this needs to be done. So I need to go ahead and make sure I've got the contacts in place so that I can keep that ball rolling. Because the earlier you contact people and you keep things moving, the better off you are. If you're wanting to do a lot of work in the spring, you can't wait until that spring in order to let somebody know that you wanna do the work. You really need to go ahead and establish that you want to get this thing done in the fall of the year before so that you can begin lining up the people that are gonna do the work or the resources needed in order to complete that work so that you have everything in place. Then the next step, step number eight on the chart was the financial assistance. I wanna do all this stuff. I have all these great management ideas, all these practices that I want to implement. Now, how am I gonna pay for this? Because I may not be able to support everything that I wanna do. There are financial pro assistance programs available. There's cost share programs, and then there's easement programs. Depending on what your goals are and how you're moving forward can depend a lot on which program would be acceptable or would be needed to utilize. Some of the resources that can give you more information on these programs, uh, the Forest Service has programs with, that help with tree planting and can help with site preparation for tree planting as well as prescribed burning and different intermediate management activities such as um, pre-commercial thinning and different things that might need to be done on some of the forested land. And then those programs are something that kind of help you with those practices, but you've also got programs through the NRCS offices where they also have some cost share program availabilities and easement programs through the programs that they have such as the EQIP program and the um, carbon sequestration program, different things that can help with those different activities that you're looking to do. Uh, the NRCS office actually has a big program called EQIP that has a lot of practices that will cover a wide variety of implementation throughout an entire property going from assisting with uh, invasive species control to establishing uh, water points to keep livestock out of streams and waterways to decrease erosion issues there and to help maintain cleaner water areas, as well as information on different things that can be done throughout the entire process. They have a ton like pages and pages of stuff that they can, they can give information for. So they're a good resource. The Wildlife Commission has a lot of con conservation programs that they assist people with getting into or giving them guidance to help get them to those programs. And there's different levels of programs and cost shares where there's cost shares where you're just getting a one-time assistance. And then there's easement programs where you can get a longer term assistance, but there are also restrictions that come with each of these um, cost shares and easements in that you need to make sure that you're reading the fine print and that you're asking questions because there's limitations on acreages 
and timetables um, with any program that you get into, you wanna make sure that you're not beginning a practice before you've received approval from that department or agency on your approval so that you make sure that you're not jeopardizing any funding that you are willing to get or have the potential to receive. So you wanna make sure you have those things in place. But the, with the easements, the easements can last anywhere from, uh, some of them are 10 year easements, some of them are I believe 15 and 20 year easements. And then there's also lifetime easements. So make sure you understand what you are getting into before you sign the dotted line and you get into these programs. Because while they are there to help you and assist you, you also need to make sure that you understand what you are signing and what you are, you are um, signing up for. But anytime you have questions on these programs, you can talk with the professionals in this industry that work in the field. Uh, soil and water offices can give answers on a lot of the conservation programs. The Farm Service Agency has programs that they run. Um, and then you can ask questions of the Wildlife Division and the North Carolina Forest Service and the NRCS office. We all know a bit about each person's program and can give you a little bit more information. And if we can't get you answers, we can point you to the person that can. So feel free to ask questions. And these are the different areas that you can go. When you're looking to contact somebody to try to get the financial assistance programs, there's, I have a link, I have links listed here, but talking to the North Carolina Forest Service, they can usually point you in the direction and get you at least an initial contact a lot of times. The NRCS office, contacting your local NRCS office is a good way to get a lot of information on these programs. And then your local farm service agency, the FSA offices, they are a good way to get a lot more of this information as well. And then the Soil and Water Division, they have the information. And then the Wildlife Resource Commission, so we all have the information available, um, but looking to contact, see who's local in your area, look to find the office in your area. If you can talk to somebody in person, great. If not, try to get up with them by email or phone and see if you can't get some more information on some of the programs that they have available and what can benefit you. So there's different levels and different ways to get through that. When you're looking to implement your practices after you've lined all this stuff up and you've got all of whether or not you're going to need cost share in place, and that's not something everybody will need or want to have, um, you can look to see how you're going to implement them. Do you have to do it all yourself? No, you don't have to. There are contractors out there who can do some of this work for you. They uh, will be able to come on, out on your property and do some of the more physical labor that you may or may not wish to do. They can do some of the, the spraying and the harvesting, of course, as well as any kind of invasive species control. There are contractors out there that can do that for you. The best way to find them is to talk to some of those agency contacts and plan writers that are generating these plans because they often have lists of people that they have either worked with or that they have either seen in the industry doing some of these activities that they're recommending. There are also lists of providers that will, for the forestry side, have on the North Carolina Forest Service website specific to each county that they are involved in that are maintained by the North Carolina Forest Service. And when you get to contacting these people, it's good to ask for references, get an idea of what they're gonna be able to do for you, ask questions, ask for some references, maybe somebody that you could go and you could take a look at the, the work that they've done and talk to the person that they've worked for previously. As with anything, you wanna make sure that you're getting, getting what you paid for and asking questions and asking for references is a good way to do that. So when you have questions and you're struggling to find somebody, talk to your contacts, talk to your plan writer, whoever you've been working with and ask them, okay, you've recommended that I establish these native warm season grasses. Now, where can I get this? 
Or is there anyone that can plant these plugs for me or do I need to do it myself? You want me to see about, you're talking about reestablishing uh, a timber stand in this open field and converting it into a forest. And how do I get the trees for that? Who, how can I get them planted? Who's gonna be doing the planting? Those people and those contact names and information can be provided in list format for you to go through and kind of look to see who's gonna be able to work best for you. And looking for supplies and equipment, how do you find it? Again, it's asking the questions of the people who are doing it. Some of the uh, agency contacts will have lists and uh, information on who is doing some of these practices and who has the items that might be available for rent, depending on what you are looking to do. Local farm supply stores will sometimes have some of the supplies that you may need when you're looking at herbicides or invasive species control, even some of the equipment such as the sprayers and things along those lines that you might be able to utilize. Uh, they have all of the stuff on chainsaws and weed eaters, weed eaters with blades, that you'd be able to utilize in some of your management techniques. When you're looking to get seed and seedlings, looking to local nurseries, whether you're, if you're looking for trees, you're gonna probably be looking at more of um, typically a state nursery if you're doing a widespread planting, such as acres and acres and acres of land. Uh, and those can be gotten through either the contractor who is doing the planting on your property, or you can buy them directly from nurseries yourselves. Um, North Carolina Forest Service has a nursery, the state of Virginia has a nursery, um, Tennessee, and then I believe uh, Warehouser also has a nursery, but they usually sell directly to the tree planters most of the time. When you're looking to get seed to direct seed and sow, I know that there's online sources for your seed that you can get. Um, the North Carolina Botanical Garden has a good uh, source for some of that, but also the Wildlife Commission sometimes has lists of uh, seed sources that they have utilized in the past or they know of a few contacts. Whenever you're looking to get trees and seed, please, 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 please ensure that you're getting native plants and seed because you don't want to be accidentally introducing on your property an invasive species that in 30 years or even four years or less, you will be silently under your breath, mumbling and cursing yourself for introducing onto your site. So please, please, please make sure that you are utilizing only native seed and native plants for whatever you're putting into your property. And once you've gone through all of that, You've done the majority of the hard work. You can take a step back and say, look what I did. I have accomplished this goal that I set out to do, utilizing this process that we've kind of gone through. And it's one of these things when you get stuck, you can go back to this and say, okay, where am I here? And I can go to the next step. But hopefully that kind of gives you an idea and a little bit more understanding on kind of how to go through the process and some of the steps. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Great, thanks Dakota. Um, sorry, that just really throws me off saying my same name to somebody else, it really happens. <laughs> we do have some time for questions if people have some questions um, before we transition to our next activity. Um, we did have, let's see, somebody commented that most counties have physical offices as well for the Forest Service and other agencies, so you can visit in person as well as using online resources. Um, so thanks for sharing that, Adele. Yeah, any other questions? All right, and if not, there will be some more time at the end of today to have more discussion and ask more questions if you have them. Um, so with that, I think we'll move to Fallon with the next activity.
Hey, hey everybody. Um, so next, I know uh, you, you got some amazing information about all the, the steps that you may or may not have gone through so far or plan to go through about landing uh, land management. Um, now I want to shake it up a little bit with with a, another small interactive activity, especially after um, everybody has seen uh, John Eisenhower's amazing talk about coming up with really good, specific, actionable goals. So um, if you were here at the last workshop, we did have a short activity that we've, we've shown the results of um, when we asked people what to, to just name a goal for their land. So given um, John's presentation about coming up with a good goal, uh, if you attended the last workshop, here's another shot to hone your, your goals. And um, if, if you weren't at that last workshop, then here's an opportunity to try a first crack at, at um, really honing a, an excellent high quality goal. Doesn't have to be perfect, but practice makes perfect. So um, in the chat, I shared a web link. Um, if you've attended these workshops in the past, you might be familiar with the Line Know It platform that we're using. But basically you you uh, will click on that link. It's lineknowit.com slash users slash FONs, et cetera. And it will take you to a web page that allows you to post a basically a, a virtual sticky note. Um, and I want you to take a few minutes and post a, a good, specific, actionable conservation goal for your land. Um, so this is your opportunity to practice. Um, after a few minutes, I will share my screen and we can kind of see what, what people are posting. Um, if you have any questions on how it works, you can post it in the chat um, or, or unmute and ask. But um, hopefully we start to see some, some uh, conservation goals pop up on the, the board. So go ahead and, and go to that, that web link and I can repost it again just so it's right, right there for everybody to see. Um, again, in the chat. All right, I'm starting to see a couple pop up. Awesome, awesome. I'll give it a, another another second before I share my screen, just so that um, I, when I share my screen, like the, the chat kind of goes away and you have to find it again. So. Um, just to make it easier for folks, I'll, I'll wait a little bit before um, before sharing my screen. I'm seeing more words per goal, which is awesome, kind of uh, following John's example of trying to be as, as specific as possible, and the details in your goal can make it more actionable. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and share. And if you if you haven't followed the link yet, you if you can find the chat window, then you'll be able to find that link and you can participate. So um, just for the moment, let me go ahead and share my screen and we can talk about what people have posted so far. OK, so um, looks like we we've got oh, what is this? What seven seven? Um, goals so far that people have posted Move this over. Oh. Okay. And uh, I, I see this, this nice long one on the left here. Let's see. My goal is to remove the invasives along my fence line. Very specific, includes a location. Awesome. Um, herbicide and mechanical. Okay. So including the methods to actually accomplish the goal and work with neighbors to re reduce invasives. I, I love adding that human component into it because sometimes that's easy to forget about, but it can be a really important way to um, amplify your effort, right? If you're not just working alone, but also working in tandem with the people nearby. That's great. Um, let's see, we've got increased quail and turkey populations with controlled burns, awesome. So specific method to accomplish that and seeding for grasses and forbs. Great, okay, that's, that's perfect. And uh, I'm gonna just kind of move these around so I can read them. So you find a local resource to help come up with a land management plan. Awesome, um, uh, for our land before building our home. Ah, oh, I love that. Okay, so um, definitely having, having a good solid plan before you start building. <laughs> 
<laughs> can prevent you from being in a situation where you've already done all the building and you're like, oh man, if only I had done X, Y, Z sooner beforehand, this would be so much easier. So, so excellent goal there. Um, Let's see, replace old fields and grassy areas with wildlife friendly trees and plants. Um, might, might be able to add something like um, identify the plants, like explore the, the species that are already there to see which ones um, might be good to stay, which ones might be beneficial and, and which ones might be invasive or, or need to be replaced. Um, let's see, eradicate tree of Evan. Um, pretty short, but um, you know, maybe can include like in what locations, um, with what methods. Um, let's see here. Thin out the canopy so the critters and plants on the ground will get the sunlight needed to thrive. Um, that's another one that's like a, a good start. Um, might want to add like like location specific. Um, are there priority areas that you want to focus that on? Um, and then maybe start thinking about what types of um, activities will accomplish that. Uh, let's see, higher woods to remove invasive plants, thin the canopy, make paths for walking, would like to, would like it to be a kind of educational forest. Ooh, okay. I can see um, uh, a, a goal that involves doing education can, can be very specific and very detailed um, in terms of making connections with local um, local schools or or local conservation organ organizations to to find people to take onto your property um, or come up with a plan to to uh, connect a network to to uh, find people to bring on to your property to teach um, or find teachers to teach about your property so that's a that's a really cool one and there's a lot of room for for detail in that one um, and and Dakota I want you to keep me on task because I'll keep going until somebody says okay we're time to move on to the next section <laughs> Yeah, sounds good. I think we are a little bit um, started ahead of time. So I think you've got time. There's, yeah, I see a lot more awesome things. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to just post one. You can keep posting um, sticky notes as, as long as you want. So if you, if you uh, come up with, a, and you can edit ones that you've already written. Um, so if you, if you want to tweak it while we're talking, you're welcome to do that. Let's see which ones which one have I not talked about so far and I, I love people are, are continuing to add them um mm -hmm. Ooh, did you, the lob lolly pine blue one did you talk about that one already the um is it the oh the blue one harvest lob lolly pines while keeping the longleaf pines Ooh, okay okay replant with longleaf followed by herbicide treatments for six to eight months after harvest very specific love it <laughs> and um since uh, since some of us here, some of the uh, presenters are more uh, familiar with with what what looks like an excellent goal or or have any suggestions for improving some of the ones listed here, <clears throat> John Eisenhower, you're you're welcome to pipe up and uh, and comment about any of these if you see something that that jumps out at you. Get to know the land as it is in the present. Learn what historical uses and management practices have have been or have already accomplished. That's that's a really good starting point. You know, you, you don't really know how to improve on your land if you don't know where where it currently is, um, and what what type of influences have made it into what it is at the immediate immediate moment. So that's a really great plan. Um, explore the possibility of conservation easements by searching for professional advice. Awesome. It's definitely one of those, those important steps. And, and um, I, I'm not sure if it's been said so far, but, but I, I want to sort of make sure that, that you guys definitely know, you know, just like your, your management plan and, and your goals can change on a, in a broader context, the specificity of your, your goals can always be improved. It's kind of this iterative process that, you know, just because you do it once doesn't mean that you're, you're completely done. So there's always um, opportunities to revisit a goal that you've you've already come up with and see how can I make it better? How can I make it more specific? Um, how can I make it more detailed? Um, so that it is easier to actually accomplish. Plant five acres of native wildflower meadow. Good, specific. <laughs> I 
And you could add to that um, research uh, seed suppliers that you know um, provide the native plant mixes that I'm looking for. Um, that can be sort of an addition tacked on to that. Um, and then of course, like before you plant native wildflowers, you might have to do site prep. So plan the steps of the site prep, including herbicide treatments or whatever other treatments to get the, the land where it needs to be before you're ready to plant. Um, See one hiding back here. Test the soil to know what I have rather than trust what's online. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, depending on the online source, it could be a very, very good source of information, but also you never know 100% until you, you test the soil. So that's, that's a great um, uh, action item, definitely. And Fallon, we've had a couple in the chat box as well. Um, oh. Somebody said, finding an alternate access for a future timber harvest and establishing an agreement with other landowners regarding a, a right of way. Nice. That's nice. a good one. That's very, that's good. That in specific. Mm -hmm. um, another one from Adele is continue with invasives eradication in my yard and surrounding woods begin this summer and then cut and paint large wisteria vines and trees and monitor slash respray dead quote unquote invasives. And then plan replacement plantings. Yes, I'm glad that you added that to your goal because if you don't plant something in the place of what you just removed, more than likely what you just removed will come back. <laughs> I have well, experienced that. Something's gonna grow there, right? <laughs> See, for, for the, the former pasture, remove the invasive grasses and forbs, most, mostly all the plants, replace with, replace with native grasses and forbs, as well as thicket plants in places, probably things like a blackberry, I'm assuming. Um, here, the goal would be to make suitable habitat for quail and other grassland species. Awesome. With only five acres. We'll be talking to the neighbors to get everyone on board. Great. Awesome. You know, I, I really, I really love this, this sort of adding the, the consent and um, uh, the, the cooperation of the neighbors into this, um, because, like I said, it's an easy things to miss, and it also can either make or break <laughs> your ability to meet your goals. If you have neighbors who are, who have very, very different goals and are working against you um, versus uh, having having a good relationship with your neighbors who um, at minimum might you know not do anything to make it more difficult for you to meet your goals and at, at most help you out and um, you know maybe adopt those goals themselves on their land. Ooh, document species using iNaturalist. I, I love that one. Um, so that would be a part of getting to know your land and that's also that's not something we have in our, our chart on the steps but um, sharing the data of what you have on your land, what species you have on your land, is a great way to uh, contribute to larger conservation, right? Um, conservation biologists need information on what species exist where, and most of North Carolina is private land. It's not accessible to, to uh, biologists. So sharing um, your, your species lists can be a really great way to give back and to sort of empower conservation professionals to see the bigger picture more appropriately. I love it. iNaturalist is also a fantastic app. If you've never used it, it's really easy. You can use it on your phone. Works amazingly for plants and insects, especially things you can easily take a photograph with on your phone. Definitely recommend it. Okay, Dakota, you see any other good ones that I've missed? I, I think I think that covers just about all of them and chat box. Um, yeah, in the chat box too, there was a question um, when you were talking about like sharing what's on your land and that data, somebody asked to clarify it, to share that how exactly. So maybe a little bit about like what iNaturalist does, um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I don't know if if I can if I open up another web page, does it show that, or is it only showing the? I know it. Yep, I see the, the holiday Google. <laughs> well, let me let me just go ahead and go to iNaturalist. Um, 
Let's see where this automatically takes me. So, so this is iNaturalist. Um, this is the desktop version um, because I'm on my, my desktop computer, but there's an app, a free app that you can download on your phone. And uh, basically what it does is um, it allows you to take a photograph of something with your, with your phone or upload a photo. Um, I don't like that banner changing. Um, and you can either identify what that living thing is and this this works for all living things so you can identify like mushrooms or birds or plants um, mammals uh, fish anything that you can get a good photograph of and like i said you can either identify it yourself if you know what it is and that goes into the world that the data point that's accessible to researchers to see oh hey like this species was found in this spot and you can toggle it to show how um how specific the location data is so if you don't want people to know that you know you live right here at this place you can sort of obscure the location so that they know it's in the general area but they don't know exactly where you you made the observation um and if you don't know what the species is there's this amazing um, sort of piece of this, this uh, site that um, guesses based on your photograph. If it's a really good photo that shows key features, it will guess and you can kind of narrow down and figure out what, what the animal was or the plant. Um, and even if you don't come up with a good guess through that automated software, this is a crowdsourced platform so other people can see your observation and they can correct you or they can offer suggestions like hey I think it might be this what do you think. Um, so it's this community of wildlife observers basically creating and sharing wildlife observations it's super powerful and um, yeah I, I don't know if I can talk it up anymore. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Fallon. And I will add that there's like, if you join um, iNaturalist, like there's a couple different groups you can join specifically, like some people are looking for certain data in certain places or certain plants and animals. Um, and that can specifically help um, scientists or organizations like track and monitor different species. Yep. Um, but yeah, thanks, Fallon. I think we're at the time now to, to kind of move on to the next thing but thank you so much for doing that and um yeah I'm stop I, sharing I, my screen here glad to see everyone's goals um but now it's my turn to share my screen to just go over some forest her announcements for the remainder of the year a couple exciting things there we go okay so first, we have a Forest Her social. It'll be virtual, kind of like what we did last year. It'll be next Thursday evening from 7 to 8 p.m. Um, on Zoom and to RSVP for that. And to get the link, um, just visit our website. And I think Bob should be dropping that link into the chat box um, momentarily. So, and that's just a casual way to connect with each other and talk about what you've done in 2022, your goals for 2023, and be a space to really just connect with some awesome women landowners and land stewards from across the state. Um, and then we also will be sending out our annual survey. We're gonna be sending that out um, either this afternoon, evening, or tomorrow. Um, and we ask that you please fill it out. It's similar to what we sent out last year, just asking, about reviewing kind of the whole year of program we, we've done and then a few other questions about um, what you hope from Forest Her and things like that. And I will know that this is different than today's evaluation that will be also um, put into the chat. And then I also wanted to note there'll be more information about this announcement too, but we will have an open landowner position on the executive board in 2023. Um, we have Karen Plaster has been our landowner on the board for the past, pretty much since the beginning in like 2019. And she has been super awesome. And I love Karen and sad to see her go, but uh, we're gonna be having an opportunity for um, another landowner to join us. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me. I can put my um, email in the chat box or to Forest Her in general, um, you can contact us via our website. So feel free to reach out for that. Um, 
not the announcements that I have for y'all. And I think we're going to go into more discussion and question time if folks have discussion or question. Um, yeah, a question for Bob and Fallon or other folks. Would you like me to leave my this shared screen up or I can take this down and we can kind of have a more face-to-face -face with everybody else discussion time? I think you could take your screen down and I think folks would love to see our faces. Awesome. All right, so yeah, does anyone have any questions for any of our speakers today or questions for general audience talking about your goals? Um, anything like that is welcome. And I will drop the eval link into the chat box and if folks could please fill it out before you head out for the day, that would be awesome. I wonder if we've addressed all the questions that people posted earlier, like during um, John and Dakota's presentation, I think there was some chatter going back and forth. And I think there were some answers posted, but um, there might be an opportunity to go into more detail. I say this not having anything in front of me. Let me. <laughs> Oh, there's a specific. Any recommendations for someone to help with a land management plan in Black Mountain? Um, yes, there are a couple different um, consulting forestry folks in Western North Carolina, and I can type those into the chat box, Christy, for you. So folks, while you think of questions and uh, having the information put into the uh, box, um, this webinar was recorded and will be available on Forrester's website soon. This is John. I just saw has... that, I'm sorry. Go I saw Jack had, had made a comment about you know, stand density as a management tool to determine harvest intervals. And yeah, you know, I, I think oftentimes we we don't necessarily address stand densities and, and how that matches up with, you know, the goals and the objectives of landowners and, and certainly not just stand, stand densities as it relates to harvest intervals, but also, you know, the response of the understory, um, the the production and the financial return tied to to harvest um, to, to thinning densities and stand densities and so there's lots of different factors that go into determine harvest intervals and you know not to to get back to goals and objectives of the landowner but but certainly what you want out of your property whether it be a hardwood stand whether it be a, a pine stand um, you know, that specific management, you know, how often you're thinning stands, how heavily you're thinning stands can really impact what you want your property to, to result in and, and how you want your property to look at the end of the day. So there's several different factors that go into that, but stand density is very important in, uh, in meeting both production and habitat goals on a property. Alrighty. Well, let's see. Oh, there's a chat coming in. A couple questions from Amy about specific resources for what to think about or learn 
before building on raw land. And then she asked specific resources for assistance and how to approach and coordinate efforts with neighbors and community. I'll be happy to chime in. I think if you're looking to build on property, first place to, to go would be to check with your local planning department. Um, oftentimes there are different requirements for um, building on a property than things like harvesting timber uh, for from a forestry perspective. So really one of the first places you should probably reach out to is your local planning department to see what your local community has for regulations. Um, that's probably the first place to start. You can also reach out to your local cooperative extension office and they can connect you with uh, folks at uh, the university that might be able to provide you more guidance related to um, developing your property. And that planning department would be at like the county level or potentially municipal level, right? Yeah, so depending on if you're within your uh, a local municipality. So for example, if you were here in Wake County and your property fell under the uh, jurisdiction of the town of Cary, you would go to the Cary Planning Department. If you were just in the county, you would go to the Wake County Planning Department. Thanks, Bob. Yep. No stupid questions, right? <laughs> And then we have another question from Kat saying, as far as choosing a professional, you have lists but can't recommend a particular one. Best way to find the really good ones or avoid the ones not so good? I think my answer for that one, Kat, is to ask around uh, for folks that have worked with some people that you're thinking of working with or find the people that uh, don't have the limitations on suggesting people because I know like the state can't suggest specific people they give the lists and things like that but there are others out there who can be opinionated about specific people but does anyone else have anything to add to that you can also for example for if you're looking for a professional forester uh, you can check with the state board of registration for foresters to see if any complaints have been filed against the forester um, I do agree. You, you, when shopping around, uh, reach out to neighbors who may have used somebody to see if how they were happy with them or not. But I, it's a lot of times it's like looking for a real estate agent or a lawyer. You want to interview two or three and see what services they're going to provide and see if you feel comfortable working with them. All right, any other questions or comments? I see one there um, from Judy asking about harvesting, looking to do some select harvesting on one of your tracks and need advice on how to get started. Um, if you wanted to get started on doing that, I would encourage you to try to contact um, a local for service office and they can help get you in contact with some folks and some consultant foresters in your area that may be able to help you through that process. So if you can go on the North Carolina Forest Service website, you can look up your local county office and get in touch with those individuals and they can begin steering you toward the people that can help you get that harvesting underway. Great, thanks for catching that question. All right, anything else from anybody? Because if not, then I think we'll hopefully see you at the social next week. Uh, remember to register 
opt for that online. And then we won't see you next week. We'll see you next year. And thanks for all of our speakers today for um, giving some great information and spending your time with us this afternoon. And Kat, the recording will be posted on the Forest Her YouTube page, or you can also find them all on our uh, website as well.